Hi, everyone, and welcome to Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies. My name is Brent Frey, and I'm the host. The show is also known as PWD Allies Podcast. Check it out in your favorite app where you find it best, best suited for you. And, uh, well, you know, I just want to ask you, uh, before we start the show, I want to uh, really emphasize for people to stay up to date on the podcast to subscribe to the channel. Uh, and uh, Great content, uh, awesome guests. Just like today, um, I'm introducing... Uh, Sonia Fursnell, the, uh, the MLA for the Green Party and the BC Legislature. Uh, yeah, Sonia, it's uh, such a great pleasure having you join us on our uh, show here. Um, this is the first time that you've actually been on our relaunch um, on the uh, podcast. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it's awesome having you on. And Let's uh, dive right in um, to a lot of the outstanding issues that are happening for people in British Columbia um, living uh, well below the poverty level. Um, it's, it's woefully inadequate, and um, the current government, uh, as they, they go a year, skip a year, raise the rates, uh, and uh, pat themselves on the back uh, and say, look what we've done. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, people are still living in legislative poverty. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a wealthy province, um, I, I just, uh, I just, it's just beyond me uh, to understand why, uh, why it's still that way. Um, but they keep saying there's more to do. Well, well, one of the things I wanted to point out is I'm wearing green today, and I'm wearing uh, combat green because, uh, you know, uh, one of the f things I wanted to focus on today was uh, when you were talking about uh, Bill. St Bill Seven, Sonia, mm. and and we refer to it as the wheel of pain. Uh, you know the uh, PWD's so, uh, income assistance as the wheel of pain, and and so I'm going to combat today talking about the wheel of pain. And uh, mm. I wondered if you could talk about that because I I tuned into that and Brent tuned into that and we we thought it was a super interesting. Uh, it was almost like you were. Um, it was almost similar to uh, the Huma, actually, almost similar mm -hmm. to the Huma committee, where you were you were talking uh, one one on one with the with the minister, and it was uh, it was you and Dan Davies and Adam Olson, and you were yep. just kind of uh, tag teaming and really like dr drilling down like, the importance of like or kind of what was missing in Bill Seven, and, mm -hmm. and so I wanted mm -hmm. I wanted you to kind of talk about that. Well, I think the most important thing that's missing is is solving the the problem that you pointed out right at the start, Brent, is legislative poverty for people with disabilities. Like this is just not something that we should accept um, as Canadians or as British Columbians that uh, being disabled uh, means for so many, for far too many people, it means living in poverty. And, and we really cannot continue to just think that that's an, an acceptable situation. Um, continuing with the, uh, the notion of, of clawing back whatever limited income people with disabilities get. So you take with one hand, you give with the other, and you take with you know yet another hand. And this is this happens over and over again for people with disabilities. And when we already have disability rates so far below the poverty line, um, there should be no excuse for any any clawback of any kind. Um, this this needs to be treated with the urgency that it deserves. More and more people with disabilities are not just living in poverty, they're finding themselves homeless. Mm -hmm. um, and when we take the, the kind of combined crises of uh, lack of affordable housing, the growing cost of basics like food, uh, and then you look at the, the astonishing low rates of disability supports, uh, it, it, there's no way to do the math to make this work for people. And so, you know, we're going to continue to advocate for uh, just like a, a, a reasonable and uh, logical response to the, the growing crisis of poverty that people with disability are facing. And to do that, we have to be honest about the, the goals. I, you know, I, I just heard a report today about BC failed or came close to failing, got a D plus in its uh, uh, its response to poverty reduction. But even that kind of language, like poverty reduction, I, I think we should be aiming for poverty elimination. We should be, mm -hmm. um, you know, really striving to address the fact that the ceiling on wealth 
seems unlimited. Now the, mm -hmm. you know, the billionaires have a combined wealth if in the trillions of dollars. Um, and that, that extraordinary transfer of wealth has happened in the last four years to the wealthiest people on this planet and in this country. And yet the, the floor, as the higher that ceiling for wealth goes, the lower the floor goes. Uh, and we have to recognize that these two things are connected and that we need governments that are willing and able to take the steps that are necessary to say, we're pulling that ceiling down. Congratulations, billionaire. You, you won whatever prize you think you get, but you, you know nobody yeah. needs 30 or 60 or 150 or $800 billion. Um, but as governments, we need to make sure that we are lifting the floor and ensuring that people are not living in the kind of poverty that they're living in. Yeah. Absolutely. And and uh, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because, uh, you know, there's all these billionaires. I mean, you just you, know, you do have to just tax them, you know, fairly. And that money goes back into back into the uh, into the coffers. And mm -hmm. that money then goes to PWD or seniors or people low income. And they mm -hmm. now they've got more money to put back into the community to help small businesses thrive and, and their community um, and all around like everybody benefits from it. Um, yeah, but it's, with it's, them not doing that, um, yeah, like it's just status quo. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, it's not just individuals, it's not, but it's also corporations. So we've yeah. seen massive profit taking in the last couple of years. Um, never let a crisis go to waste uh, is mm. the, the kind of thinking here. And so when we see grocery corporations taking home billions in profits and we see the oil and gas industry, uh, walking away with tens of billions just in Canada alone. Um, you know, it, it, we really have to ask ourselves, um, how is it that uh, governments at all levels are allowing for this kind of deepening of inequality and, 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 and unfairness, right? The, the, mm -hmm, yeah. the unfairness with which um, people are being treated, uh, the kind of um, loopholes that are given to corporations and to the wealthiest. Um, I always, uh, you know, look at how how easy it is for the wealthier people get, the easier it is for them to avoid paying taxes. And yet um, people who are living in poverty are monitored and checked and every penny that can be clawed back is clawed back. And I, I just, I find this to be such a, a disgraceful system. Well, I just mm -hmm. wanted to jump in on something that you you just said right now, and that's you you use the the word unfair, unfairness, and uh, I think you know that I've had my survivor's pension clawed back for the last ten and a half years now. My wife's, my first wife's, uh, you know, I got an inherited pension, and it's been clawed back for uh, ten and a half years as unearned income, and. Um, you know, I've tried to have it. I've I've done four different human rights complaints, right? And and the 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 human rights tribunal comes back and says, "Well, it's not discriminatory, Neil. It's only unfair." And that that's yeah. what they kept come back. It's it's not discriminatory. It's only unfair. And and I would agree with that statement if if you weren't going to um, account for the truth of what a pension actually is yeah like as, as soon as you as soon as you look at the truth of what what a pension is supposed to be it's supposed to be a protected income yeah it's supposed to be like you know a protected income that is um you know like i said protected so yeah. if it's pr protected you're not supposed to be able to touch it right it's yeah. a guaranteed protected income it means you're not supposed to touch it and that's that's the truth of it and so, I, like I said, if you weren't going to acknowledge the truth of it, then I would say it's just unfair. But because you have to acknowledge the truth of it, that's when it becomes discriminatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Neil, I just want to pick up on that. Like, you know, I think one of the things that that Canada always prided itself on was this idea that we're a fair country. Mm -hmm. John yeah. Wilson Saul even wrote a book called uh, Fair Country. And... Um, and I think it's it's one of those fundamental values that we we hold, and that um, you know I certainly grew up thinking how how much fairness mattered, 
And so for you to be told it's not discriminatory, it's discriminatory, it's just not fair. Well, mm -hmm. our policies and our legislation and how we enact these should be fair and people mm -hmm. should feel that fairness. And I think that more and more people are feeling that unfairness in the way that, um, that governments are operating right now. And the goal should be not to burn it all down, but to really build it back up to being an, a, a much more fair mm -hmm. uh, a place that we create collectively as, as Canadians and British Columbians. And, you know, I, I, I think that that's something, it's hard to, there's a lot of anger and a lot of fear in the political rhetoric right now. And it, I think it's tapping into that feeling that people have, like, things just don't feel fair. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are, that's a solvable problem. And well, well, yeah, well, especially with like the cost of living with the price of food and the rents are like, uh, I've just, I've never seen the rents so high in my life. Yeah. And when the government provides for persons with disabilities, maximum five hundred dollars i mean uh the light the latest there was the latest stats that just came out today and they're showing in victoria just alone in victoria the uh the median rent is two thousand one hundred twenty dollars yeah I, I mean that's the median rent uh for a one bedroom like wow yeah. and, and yeah, yeah there's discrimination because like landlords are gonna say well uh, we don't want you using your full check to basically pay for the rent. How are you going to live? And then so then they don't want to then rent to a person with disabilities. I mean, it's no fault of their own. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I put a recommendation out to the minister who's in charge of the uh, poverty reduction as, as an idea uh, about RGI. Like for seniors, the uh, SAFERS program, getting all that extended over to the persons with disabilities in the market housing. Yeah. Um, because then we that that the individual won't have to basically uh, pay a, a huge chunk of their income to their landlord uh, where it'll then get subsidized where the difference will get put on where seniors have that same thing they don't have to move where they live but they love the community that they live in or their place yeah. they can stay where they are um, that's an idea um, of course the other part too is they just raise the rates and that way they can choose what they want to and you know yeah. what i think you know what i think a uh, $500 shelter rate is it's a pink mm. unicorn, though, like that one behind your head there, Brent. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pink unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. the, the, I mean, we called for earlier this year for there to be vacancy control put in. Yeah. Because what's happening, I just uh, met with some people in Victoria last week. And so an, uh, an apartment that's currently renting, say, a two-bedroom apartment for $2,000 a month, a uh, tenant moves out, and that rent is doubled it's double to $4,000 a month. Yeah. yeah. And so without vacancy control, uh, what we're seeing is uh, basically a market that is allowing for, uh, you know, landlords, but often more importantly, investment bodies, real estate investment trusts that own a lot of rental income, uh, rental properties now to say, well, we're going to put the rent up to the highest that it can, that, that it, we can possibly do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so disappointed that, um, you know, we've lost over 100,000 affordable rental units in BC since 2016, probably, you know, significantly more. I know that between up until 2021, it was 100,000 affordable units were lost in this province. And when we lose that volume of affordable housing, uh, and, and we are not replacing it with affordable housing. We're replacing it with housing that's out of reach for, for a huge number of people. Um, we get the, the kind of terrible scenarios we're in. And so governments, again, have a, a role to play in saying, hey, you know, there has to be some, some limits uh, and some, some fairness built into this. And, and vacancy control is one way that they could do that. Yeah, like there's an example, and I'll throw this out to you, is... Um, we had some former um, neighbors who lived uh, right above us here, and uh, they were paying $1,750 a month. They got a rent increase. Their, uh, their yearly annual rent increase came in, and I was kind of surprised that they were moving. Uh, they had told me a month in advance that they were going to be moving before the rent took effect. And they did that because they couldn't, well, they, they moved simply they couldn't afford the high rent. Mm. Uh, the rent increased over $1,800. 
but they also were trying to do a favor to the new tenant so that the landlord wouldn't actually scoop up on that new rent increase so that the new tenant would then be paying 1750 um, my landlord uh, kind of gloated up uh, saying, well, the sky's the limit. And I go, well, how high are these rents going to go? Whatever the market will bear. And I, my jaw dropped to Sonia. I was like, are you kidding me? I said, people need a safe place they can call home. They, yeah. Well, our investors are expecting a rate of return. I'm like, housing is not supposed to be treated as a commodity. Yeah. And I yeah, the landlord had nothing yeah. to say. Like, I mean, nice people yeah. and all, but they're like, but it's part, part of doing business. And so, yeah, I agree. A vacancy control needs to be put in place uh, because otherwise these rents are just going to keep going higher and higher. And we need, we need really like a, a generational investment into mm -hmm. non-market housing, into yeah. affordable, truly accessible housing, housing that suits the needs of people, a housing mm -hmm. that creates community as well. So co-op housing, uh, you know, we really need to turn the tide on this. And the only way that's going to happen is for governments to choose to make those investments into uh, there being a significant portion of housing that is not subject to these market forces and it are, is not commodified. And, mm -hmm. and as long as we say housing is just another commodity and you're out there in the market and you can make as much money as you want, we are not meeting that basic human right of, of housing. Of, of people have a right to have housing. And yeah. that's what's really been failed. There's, there's, another, the, there's another part too that I would love to do. Oh, sorry. I was just going to do something there. Uh, okay. Neil is on that is what I would like to too, uh, see, um, Sonia, is um, like say PWD to get into like co-op housing or nonprofit um, to have it based on the individual, not the household income, so that if two PWD move into, say, uh, a co-op housing, right now the under the um, BC Housing under the Act, it actually states because uh, we were talking to uh, to Ravi um, uh, before about that, and uh, he said unfortunately the Act actually states that if two PWD move into like a low income housing, it's classified as one income. And even though they may not have, like they may be not be together, but it, the, court, they, the law states that they need to have one income. I'd like to see that change so that now people are now going to be housed more. Like it's not going to create less homelessness. More people are going to be able to be housed and they're under one roof. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think we have to ensure that all of these policies are focused on the well-being yeah. of the people. That they're and the fairness. Their, yeah, the yeah. fairness. Fairness and equity. Yeah. We are at the end of uh, our time already. Thanks, Neil. It wow. Went, it went fast. So It, it but, always goes so, fast. Yeah. 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 I appreciate I this conversation and, and we'll carry it on. And, and um, you know, I, I really uh, want you to know that as BC Greens, we are going to put these issues front and center. Um, it really matters to me that... Uh, that people are are struggling and suffering to the extent they are, and, and particularly people with disabilities, and and we can and must solve this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, it, poverty doesn't need to exist. Uh, it's it's a uh, policy choices, and um, I want to thank you very much, Sonia, uh, for coming on today. And I want to extend the uh, the welcome for you to come back uh, in the very near future, and we'll uh, we'll continue our conversation where we left off and. Um, you know, I just want everyone to know that there is an election coming up uh, scheduled in October of uh, this year. I believe it's October 19th of 2024. Um, so uh, definitely your vote counts. Get out there and vote. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we gotta we got to change this province. Uh, and so that uh, everyone is in, included in in our great um, province that we call Crip the vote, as they say, Crip the yeah. vote. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's really going to be interesting. Um, I, I was actually on the radio this morning, Sonia. Uh, we had a call-in show on the Jody mm -hmm. Bant show. And I called in and it was to ask the uh, leader a question. Um, so I, I hammered in and I had 30 seconds. And it was like, okay, Brent, you got 30 seconds, go. So I just, wow, do, 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 do. <laughs> you can imagine that. <laughs> but I mentioned about seniors, people with disabilities, low-income low, low income individuals who said, yeah. what are you going to do to to fix this like about the uh, pwd rates and about housing and yeah it was uh yeah it was pretty well like a, a no answer like it was like kind of stuff that i already knew um 
So I, I think it was opportunity that, um, that things can change in a good way. Um, so definitely we will continue on um, advocating and pushing hard on the government and hold them accountable because uh, poverty, like the ministry, they call poverty reduction. They shouldn't be poverty at all. That word poverty yeah. shouldn't be in there. It should be ministry of social services. Yeah. 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 I agree. Okay. Thank you both so much. And we'll talk Thanks. again soon. Yeah. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Sonia. Thank you.